Imagine a civilization that was a global, sophisticated civilization that connected all around the world that existed more than 13,000 years ago. And that civilization was wiped out. Now, what would survive that civilization? Go ahead and pull up that image again. So have one I do think it's interesting make. because I yeah. had this similar conversation before you answer this. I had this yeah. similar conversation with someone recently before you answer this. And he was, we were having a conversation about cave drawings. And he said, if these civilizations were so advanced, why would they not be able to create better drawings? And so my answer is, I believe what you're about to say. So carry on. The answer to that is that those civilizations that did cave paintings were primitive and they're not part of this group we're talking about. We're talking there. You're talking about nomadic hunter gatherer Neanderthal Denisovians that were, you know, hundred, like hundreds of thousands of years ago. And then other groups that were more primitive along the way, because understand, like even today in our sophisticated technological world, there are still groups in remote parts of the Amazon and in, and in islands in the Pacific that don't have anything. They live in complete isolation in harmony with nature. We still coexist with that. And they did as well. So there were other groups that were primitive that were writing on cave walls and such, but that doesn't mean that's the only story. Okay. That's why we're going to get into this. What you're now, seeing on the screen at, right here. Here we have in Machu Picchu, these math, massive granite blocks. Okay. On the bottom most level. And then you have this very, very primitive um, cobble and mortar built on top. Now that primitive stuff on top is younger, Right. And then the stuff on the bottom is way, is much more sophisticated and older. Wait a minute. That doesn't make sense because if civilizations were primitive and then they became more sophisticated, then why would the most sophisticated be on the bottom? Think about that. Mm -hmm. That's that spark that goes off. You're like, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. So it's backwards then. It's completely backwards. Getting around and that's to, where we're to understanding this is that all around the world, we have these megalithic ancient civilizations that created these massive megalithic block temples and pyramids all around the world that are so sophisticated in understanding the um, alignments to the stars and our and energy centers of our earth that we still don't even understand how they did it or what or some of the reasons why they did it. But that those megalithic blocks and the ancient texts that we're about to get into, known as cuneiform texts out of the Fertile Crescent region, were, is basically all that survived. All that survived to these civilizations are those two things. So aside from the technology that you're about to talk about, my first observation when I first saw the pyramids of Egypt or any of these stones in all over the world is, A, the fact that they have 90-degree right angles, the fact that they're massive, massive stones that are tonnage in weight, and, and, and the fact that the stratification of them, where they sit in these archaeological digs, not only are they beneath some of these more primitive stones that you're just calling out, but they also go depth down architecturally. Like they're not just what you see visually. They're architecture there's dug into the ground, correct? But these stones, sorry, I hit the screen too fast. But the thing that blows me away is that the, these stones weigh tons and tons and tons. Exactly. And if anybody was primitive, how would they have been able to have the technology to put those in place in the first place? Thank you. That's a great point. That was exactly what I was about to get into. Sorry, I didn't mean to steal your thunder. But I asked, so here's, let me just tell you one piece. Yeah. I asked my dad about this, and my dad was a staunch Christian, ha, really conservative, and made us read the Bible every night and interpret it. And with these, and I used to get, I'm like you, I used to question everything. And I asked my dad this question one time. I'm like 10 years old. And I said, if, wow. if primitive people built these pyramids, how these stones weigh tons and tons and tons. And if, if they were just ancient um, Egyptians who built those, how, the technology at that time was ba barely the wheel. How did they get all those stones in place? And my dad was like, oh, yeah, there's not questions that we ask. You know, it's just God, faith <laughs> right. of God. And I'm like, that doesn't yeah. make any sense. So, all right, yeah. carry on. Sorry. No, that's a great point. And that's, that's what we're getting into is I want you to wrap your head around, well, what does it mean to be sophisticated? Okay. All right. Look at our society today. People walking around on their, on their phones. In most cases, they're playing some like angry birds game rather than using the phone to learn every piece of wisdom they can. But I want to strongly emphasize in that idea of knowledge, you cannot be look in the mainstream. This is a tightly organized, tightly controlled thing. And this is where you start getting down the rabbit hole and conspiracies. Some people might roll their eyes, but imagine you're an archaeologist. You've spent years going to school. You like, I want to, I want to dig up, I want to go to ancient sites and I want to uncover these places. 
You developed, you spend an enormous amount of money, you spend years in classes, and then you get part of this archaeological institution. If you don't follow the rules, just like a teacher in school, if you don't follow this main, this mainstream viewpoint on how all of this aligns, you will be laughed out of your job. You'll lose your credentials and your, all your, your life's work will essentially be over. That's why so many people in my field were not licensed archaeologists. Because how could we be? We would be hampered by this 6,000-year timeline. Like, So look at these stones right here. I can tell you that those stones and many others we're going to find around the world are proven to be over 13,000 years old when they were created. Okay, That means that our timeline of civilization is at least double, if not far more than double, the age of what we know. Now, you brought up a great point, Devo, these stones— we're talking about multi-ton stones. In some cases, these stone blocks are so enormous, and, and not, these aren't even the, nearly the biggest ones. You go to places like Baalbek, Lebanon, that we're going to show after, or the Yangshan Quarry in China, or the Imperial, Imperial Wall in Japan, or um, all throughout Peru in, in, the, in the temple, in the Valley of the Temple, um, and, and all the way through Machu Picchu and South America and Bolivia and so many other places around the world. We're talking about some blocks that are 1,000, 1,500, over 10,000 tons, okay? We can't even move those today with modern machinery, and I want people to wrap their heads around that. We can't. If, we, if they take a crane, okay, the largest cranes we have, they can't move anything over like a, a couple hundred tons, and we're talking about blocks that are so big that we can't even move them today. Not only that, but here's the wild thing that is the evidence spark that is going to make people, okay, wait a minute, that makes sense. If civilizations are 6,000 years old, then the cultures that lived during this time had what are known as Bronze Age tools. That means that they had tools that are part of um, a certain hardness scale, okay? Like the copper and bronze tools, obviously. And so the idea behind that is if you have granite right here, look at that, Pete, those granite blocks. Go look up what's known as the Mohs hardness scale. Granite is one of the hardest stones on, in the world. And there's a reason they chose it because it has a high quartz content and it's extremely um, difficult to erode. So it'll last like forever, okay? There's a lot of reasons they chose it. But also, if you have bronze age tools, and you try to carve something that is harder than your the tools you're working with, you're not going to get anywhere. You can't even manipulate those stones, which means that they had technology and sophistication that we don't even understand. And none of those tools and none of the, those things are left anymore. They're all gone. So you have these mysterious sites around the world where there's just these giant, perfectly carved, like some of them like in, in Tiwanaku in, in Bolivia are so sharp on their angles uh, carved out of a thing called and andesite that you can cut your finger on it and it's over 13,000 years old. That's how incredible they were able to cut some of these stones and build these places that are just in ruins all around the world. And so I just want to add to this, look at this picture just one more time. What this means is that that civilization that created those that lower foundation, that incredible sophisticated master civilization, they were wiped out in a catastrophe, gone. And then the, the actual Inca we think of came out of the Amazon jungle, right? They found these giant remnant blocks all around the, play, the world or around the, the region, and they tried to recreate it, and they couldn't. But they knew that these, these sites were sacred and important, but they just could not recreate their technology and, and knowledge. And that's the emphasis I want people to understand. So another thing that, I, and if you're going to touch on this, just let me know, and I won't go down to go down this too far. But in some of the pyramids and in some of the references you've made all around the world, these stones are so precise. Not only are they heavy with multiple tonnage, but their cut diagrams are so sharp and so tight that in some cases you can't even fit a piece of paper in between some of the cracks. And furthermore, I, I listened to one of your podcasts on the astrological formations of each of them, that they're all in perfect alignment with star, astrological starscapes, et cetera. And, and, and I was, are you going to expound on any of that? We're going to get to that on number three when we talk about the pyramids. Okay. Sorry. Yes. Spoiler alert. But yes, don't Just, worry. I'll, we'll we'll cover all of those as we go along, but I want to, I don't want to go 
jumbled around too much. I okay, want to be able to build, I want to build foundations for people as we get there. But yes. So let's go ahead and go to number two and we can talk about um, how sophisticated some of these civilizations were. I only have you for an hour, so I'm trying to squeeze in literally every single it's Okay, we can, we can go question. a little over if we need to. Yeah, okay. No, no, no worries. Okay. Is the wild so here, thing. There's a concept called geodesy. Okay. Geodesy represents these certain points around the earth where there's these energetic areas. Um, this is also a, a relatable term called ley lines, which is basically that, okay, well, he, he, here's what's wild about it, right? The earth is just an energetic sphere. Okay. Don't think of it in just its physical way. Think about it in an energetic way. So anything that occurs with the earth, and we'll get into that we talk about cyclical catastrophes. Anything that's going to be physical on the earth has to happen on an energetic level first. Okay. So it's a giant energy sphere is our planet. That's why there's a wobbling north and south magnetic pole, which everything feeds into on this harmonious ener harmonious energetic state. Okay. When you look at geodesy, which means these points that align up around the world, there's an area of the 30 degree parallel, 20 and 30 degree parallel, where you see that, well, wait a minute. So instead of civilizations building these structures because there was water nearby or it was good for them to farm and then they created these, these structures, no, not at all. In fact, you look at a place like Tiwanaku and Pumapunku at well over 12,000 feet elevation in this incredibly arid place with no resources, and yet they build all these structures there. Why? When you map out these energy centers known as ley lines, convergence zones of energy on the earth, and you map out these specific locations um, that they were building on these lines that had to do with energy, again, energy, energy, energy. You find out they were all built in these perfectly mapped spots around the world. So rather than being by accident, they actually created them all in specific places. Okay. Now, can I, can I interrupt for a second? Cause I want to go back to those ley lines because that has a lot of criticality to a lot of the stuff that's gone on in early, in early the geo, sorry, in the archeological formations, right? Can you elaborate real quickly on what ley lines are? Because I know a lot of people don't okay. know what that means. So imagine you have a, the earth as a sphere and you have a magnetic north and south pole, okay? Mm -hmm. And they have this balance of energy. It's called electromagnetic energy that's around the planet. There's, there's energy lines, literally the energy that focuses along these specific lines. And where those energy places converge, that's where you get a ley line. And when those energy convergence areas, you can harness that energy and use it for certain purposes, okay? And they knew uh, far more about energy in the cosmos and our planet than we ever know right now. Like, that's what I'm saying about their sophistication. Yeah, we may have cell phones and computers and, and various things like that, but our level of knowledge on these areas is, is minuscule compared to them, okay? Minuscule. How thank would you, you map you. a ley line then? That's the that's the point. And we're, as we get into the pyramids and we get into this understanding of where these are, how do they know that? How do they know where these places were? They would travel great distances just to build these temples specifically because of the locations that they're on. So if anyone was to like go type in ley line map of the earth right now, and you'll see where these ancient sites are around the world, you see that a lot, most of them line up to either ley line convergence zones or geodesy points, basically like, not like think of like the equator is like halfway through the earth. Well, you're talking about these parallel lines that relate to energy on in other in other ways, like above or below them. And it has to do with again energy of the now, earth. Now, what we have on the screen is a place in that proves without a doubt that these civilizations are older than thirteen thousand years ago. And you're not going to hear this in history books in in school at all because it's very much um, it's pseudo archaeology. Okay, so. In 1995, uh, a German archaeologist named Schmidt came into Turkey and found this incredible site up on a hill. Okay, and and when they were and they, by the way, this entire site since 1995 has only been excavated five percent of it. Five percent. What they found was there was these underneath massive amounts of soil. They found these enormous T-shaped pillars, multi-ton, giant T-shaped pillars. And there's all these bizarre, very integrately carved um, symbols and, and animal-like creatures all over them, right? So you think, oh, well, that's just animals on the earth. No, not at all. 
what we're really looking at here is the largest and most sophisticated cosmic library on the entire planet. So in the image right there on the left, that's known as Pillar 43. And you see the vulture on the left and how he has a, a ball in his hand and how there's a scorpion below him. That's, that, that represents the, the constellation of, of Cygnus and then Scorpius down below it. And the ball above it is a star called Danib, right? This is an astronomical library. They were mapping the cosmos, okay? And they knew the alignments of where the cos uh, these constellations would align up to what's known as the precession of the equinox. So important to understand. What it means is our earth wobbles on its axis. It's not straight. It goes like this. I can't, you can't see me. It, it wobbles like this. Okay. And what that means is the zodiac ages, not your birthday, but the actual zodiac ages represents the way that the earth is facing certain constellations over a 2100 year cycle. Now that whole cycle as it spins around is called the great year or the precession of the equinox. And it means that an entire rotation of the earth is about 26,000 years and faces these different constellations during that time. Why would they have wanted to know that? Wow. Well, turns out that there are cyclical cat catastrophes that occur on the earth every 13,000 years. So if you're a civilization and you know that the most important thing you can preserve is knowledge, you would need to track not only energy of the cosmos, because that also plays an effect. And I don't want to pretend it's just these other effects. There's, there's energy of the cosmos that relates to when you're facing different constellations and planetary alignments that have to do with consciousness, of course, but they're also tracking these catastrophes and they know that when it comes, they're going to have to preserve their knowledge because if they don't, all the knowledge, the subsequent knowledge that the entire civilization was able to, to amass could be wiped out. And then, and then there'd be nothing for the following civilization, if there was a civilization, to then build off of. And that's what Gobekli Tepe is. I, I have a question. So you said in the outside of the call that civilizations actually, in, in the terms of their advancements, denigrated over time. Yes. So one civilization created this, which means some sort of information would have had to been passed down to them that there was a cyclical 13,000 year catastrophe. How would they have known at this time period that every 13,000 years there was a catastrophe looming or pending, et cetera, if the information denigrated over time? Yeah. So that's where that's, that's the key point to make. And I, that's great. When they first found this site, it was buried under enormous amounts of soil. Okay. And it's been calculated that it, it took as long to bury this site as it did to create it. How would a civilization bury a site in, in, that took that much time unless it was the only way to protect it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Furthermore, because that site was buried under enormous amounts of soil, the organic matter, which is you can't, you cannot date rock. That's why any, I don't care who, what academic tells you a site is a certain age that they're trying to date rock. It, it's all, it's not, it's all inaccurate. It's not true. The only way you can date is through organic matter. That's it. Or ice core samples. That's the only two things you can do. So when this site was buried over by soil and it was all protected, the organic matter, the small little tiny bits of organic matter that were able to stay in the cracks of these giant pillars was able to be preserved. So what did they do? They radiocarbon dated the organic matter in multiple spots, not just one, in multiple different pillars of this site. And they came up with an age that this site was built at least 11,800 years ago, at least. That immediately throws the civil, the date of sophisticated civilizations more than double through evidence-driven radiocarbon dating. I mean, we know that. And so what that means is that we're the first civilization to come along to dig this up and then learn about this. But it's been guarded and hidden because if people think about this whole thing, why is all this being hidden? Why? Number one, we're way more sophisticated than we've been told. Our story is much older. And two, if they learned that these ancient civilizations knew about cyclical catastrophes, people would be freaking out right now because we're exactly 13,000 years ago from when this last event occurred. And that's a whole nother discussion that we can probably briefly touch into at the end, which is where the newest book that I'm going to be writing after the one with Billy Carson is going to be focused on. Okay. So say that one more time. We're at the end of this cycle. We know that because of yeah. 
astrology. We can study that. Yep. We, we understand that scientifically speaking. So technically speaking, this cyclical effect, which repeats itself roughly every 13,000 years, we know for a fact that we're approaching that end of that 13,000 years. That's cycle. right. So theoretically speaking, everything, and I'm not trying to be doomsday here, but theoretically speaking, the earth, whatever chaos is going on right now, there could be an impending cataclysmic disaster. Is that what you're getting at? Except, except it goes, it goes much deeper than that. The Maya predicted, and again, the Maya were way more sophisticated than we've been told. The Maya predicted that there would be a future time when a civilization would be, have the technological means to be the first ones to ever survive this, this, this cyclical catastrophe in history. And we are that civilization that has the technical technological means to survive this. Wow. And I, and I, and, that, and I can tell you all the evidence on how that's going to happen and what they're secretly doing to prevent this, but it's called the global elites that know all about this. The, the, the fat cats at the top that make the real decisions and that very much exists. If people don't believe it does just go do a little research. There are a lot of very powerful individuals that know all about this. And that's one of the reasons why this information has been taught to us in the way that it has, because if people knew what was potentially going to happen, they would be freaking out right now. But I will tell everyone so that people don't freak out listening to this, that there are very specific and secretive things that are going on right now that are, that is, that I believe will be successful in preventing this for the first time in all of the different versions of, of the, we've come along, we will be the first ones to not have a reset. Okay. Wow. It's a cliffhanger. No. All right. Carry on. <laughs> My mind is just like, Let's go ahead. you're going to be up all night. <laughs> or two. We'll be like, yeah, go but- ahead and go to number three now. Jesus. Apparently didn't have anything to do with this. Is this right? Okay. You want you, this, right? You can, you can go but, there. Um, yeah. And don't forget, we have to go to the other slide that, that goes along with it as well. So which one do you want me to do first? This one or the other one? You can start there and then okay. we'll, and then we'll move over to the other one. So um, again, I know this is going on. So I'll try to like, I'll try to speed it up a little bit. So uh, the, the great pyramids of Giza, right? Some of the most sophisticated and incredible structures on earth. We're taught in part of that wonderful Rockefeller education system and history books that these were built by the dynastic pharaohs of Egypt, like Khufu, um, to basically be tombs. Okay. The problem is, and that's like the way they describe them, right? Oh, so these were built by two, uh, built four thousand years ago, four or five thousand years ago, to be two of um, of these pharaohs, right? And so that was the whole purpose behind them. That's why they were made. So don't ask any more questions, right? The problem is, there's never been a pharaoh ever found in any in any of these pyramids. Okay, number two, there's never been any writings ever found either. When they say that Khufu's name was on a stone block. Um, I want to give you an example about that. Let's say there's a statue that is down the road from here that someone spent a lot of time, this beautiful statue that, that, that they made, right? And I go and I spray paint my name on that statue. Matt was here, right? And then thousands of years go by and then they find that statue. They're like, oh my God, Matt, the great conquering hero built this statue. Did I build it? Or did I just put some graffiti on it and then they misinterpreted it? That's what they found with Khufu. They found one single area in the Great Pyramid where it mentioned Khufu that someone had, that a a pharaoh had written into a wall. And then they use that as justification that Khufu built the pyramid. Guess what? There's absolutely nothing in that pyramid that has anything to do with a tomb. In fact, it's the very opposite. Those structures are the most sophisticated ancient structures on the entire planet. They compose of 2.3 million stone blocks make up the Great Pyramid with an average weight of 10 tons each. Okay. So if you're thinking right now, imagine a civilization that we're talking like the Egyptians have these slaves with, with, with pillar, uh, with pulleys and these wooden blocks and they were hauling these in. No, no, no. Not only that is impossible, but we could not build these today. And furthermore, there's specific air shafts that were, were created above these massive stone blocks that are like 30 feet above um, these rooms, which I, we have no idea how they even got those in the, into place. But they're these shafts. They're not air shafts. They're just shafts that point out to the stars that align to specific star constellations. But not only that is they don't line up anymore. 
So if you take precession of the equinox, like I said, the wobbling of the earth, right? And you put it into a computer and you calculate when the great pyramid of Giza was known as the king and queen's chamber. When did they align to the constellations of what they are? You find out that the king's chamber aligned to the Orion's belt, which is what those three stars are. It's actually a literal representation of the three belt stars of Orion. That's, that's, these, big, that's these big bright stars up above. Right. Right? Yeah. But not only that, but the, the, the king's chamber was aligned to Orion's belt well over 12,000 years ago, potentially even 36,000 years ago. That's how procession works. You have to go back another entire procession, okay? Furthermore, the queen's chamber is pointing to Sirius, and you'd have the exact same thing where we know that it's it, it, it's old and we're told because of the alignments of the stars and the, the sphinx, the great sphinx in front of it, which, by the way, was Ricard, who was never a pharaoh, was a lion, just so we know. Later on, it was Ricard. There's weathering all around the what's known as the Sphinx enclosure. And geologists like Robert Schock and other great minds like John Anthony West have gone in and they've studied the Sphinx enclosure. And instead of wind weathering, it's, it's very clear water weathering, very significant, like, like torrents of water had, had washed through on those areas, meaning that that had to have been built. If you look at climate records, when a time when great amounts of water were around in Egypt, when was that? The same time period that these stars aligned because of the procession of the equinox over 12,000 years ago. So we know, based on all these little pieces, that these civilizations were far more sophisticated and older than we're told. And these structures were built. Now, go ahead and go to that other image to add another layer to this. Before you move on that, so because of this, this cyclical equinox rotation, these stars, they're not currently in the same alignment than the image you're showing now, correct? No, so this image is actually not literal. What it's depicting is not only do were, were those shafts, the king and queen's chambers, we'll call them not shafts, chambers, pointing to those specific star constellations at a different time, but the three pyramids of Egypt, the great pyramids, were built as a literal representation of the three bell stars of Orion in the heavens, as above, so below. They were creating these structures not only to have specific spots on the earth, but to literally mimic the locations of stars in the cosmos. Okay. It's wild. Yeah, okay, so go so really quick. Another image. Welcome to the Valley of the Kings. The Valley of the Kings is that Lisa's been to, um, is over 400 miles to the south. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.